My name is Don Dixon and I want to thank you for joining me for another edition of our Structure Fishing Workshop. In our last get together, uh, we talked about the basic reaction a fish has to the passing of a cold front. And as we move in further on our study, understand that we'll never be very far away from talking in terms of how weather affects the fish and then conversely, of course, how it affects our success and or our failure. But today we're going to move on and we're going to talk about water, a beginning discussion of water. Now, as serious fishermen, we try to reduce all of the multitude of fishing aspects down into what we refer to as a guideline or a simple observation that might give us a quick answer to a multitude of questions, <laughs> period. We need a guideline. Now the reason for these guidelines is simple. I mean, I don't want to be confused or all up in the air about an interpretation of a fishing situation. I want to be able to make a judgment. And in order to do that, I need a guideline. Bottom line is I want to be able to be in a position to make a few simple observations and then make a quick decision and be able to interpret a fishing situation. Is it going to be easy? Is it going to be tough? Uh, which approach makes the most sense? I want to have this guideline that's going to give me those answers real quick. Now, as we enter into this discussion on water, our key ingredient here what we're going to be talking about from beginning to end is water color. So water color is going to be a key for us. It's going to determine the amount of light penetration that there is. And keep in mind, we said as we started to study, our key ingredient to interpreting weather and water conditions is light. It's the one thing the fish has a real problem adjusting to, and he can't adjust quickly. So clear water means tough fishing. Now there are different degrees of water color. And if you have a really good watercolor, you have minimum light penetration, you have shallower fish, you have warmer water, they eat more, they swim faster, they grow faster, everything gets good if you have good watercolor. So as we interpret our water, the biggest key that we're ever going to have, in fact, nothing about water, nothing about water, will affect your success or failure nearly as much as watercolor. I'm going to be harping on that and harping on it and harping on it. <laughs> because it's a way that we can sort of offset all these ill effects that the fish experience. Now don't misunderstand. We're not saying there are no fish in clear water. There are, obviously. But what we are saying is water clarity depends on how deep the fish are. The more dingy colored water, the sanctuary won't be as deep. The migrations will be more often. They'll go further and they'll stay longer. We're talking about the same fish now. We're talking about the same weather condition. The only difference is water color. But my friends, if you have a choice, you have two lakes close to your home. One's clear, and one has cloudy water. Go fish the cloudy water. You're going to just up your chances 100%. You know, when it comes to watercolor, normally I would end with this story, but it's such a good story. I've got to tell it to you, and I don't know whether Buck did it intentionally to make a point to me because this was really a big thing with Buck. Watercolor, he was always talking about watercolor. Always. And thinking back on it, my idea is that he maybe just did it like that to make a point to me. But I'm not sure because as I have mentioned to you before, he was a bit of a character. He was brilliant, but he was also pretty funny and pretty much a character. At any rate, he was always getting calls at the factory. Uh, fishermen that 
we had all over the country would be calling and saying, man, there's a new lake with just, you know, they've been starting to catch fish at this so-and-so lake. And, you know, Buck, it'd be great if you come out and take a look at it. And Buck was always looking for areas to have schools and that kind of thing. And if there was ever a lake he hadn't fished before, he was interested in fishing it. So at times, if he'd get enough calls about one particular lake, he'd say, hey, let's go. We're going we're gonna, to uh, suit up and go out there and see what makes this lake tick, you know. So that was just part of the routine around Buck's Baits back in the day. So I don't know. He must have got 10 or 12 calls. I think it was a club of guys, to be honest with you. <laughs> they wanted him to come out and fish their lake. But they were telling him what a great fishing hole this was, and it catches so many big fish. So Buck said to me, uh, I was at the factory, and my old partner Tommy had come on board by then, and he was with me. We were down there working on some material and stuff, and, uh, and he said, let's go out there. We'll take two vehicles and two boats, okay? So we took his camper and his boat, and we took my boat, and we took off. And we're heading out to, and for the life of me, I was thinking about it this morning, and I can't tell you whether that lake was in Arkansas or Oklahoma. I think it was in Arkansas. Can't can't remember exactly, but we're out there in that in that area. And from North Carolina, seemed to me it was around 550 or 600 miles, something like that. Maybe even 700. It could have been 700 miles. But at any rate, it was a pool. Now the way Buck would do things. He might start off four in the afternoon. He'll still be driving at four in the morning. Yeah, he'd just go and pull off into a little uh, uh, rest area or something, sleep for an hour and a half or so, and back going again. That's how he. That's how he was. So we're traveling out there. We pretty much drove all night. And the next morning, it was about ten o'clock, as I recall, when we actually got to the lake. And they had a long dock which was running out uh, at the boat ramp. So the three of us went down to the water's edge. We got on that dock and we walked out the dock all the way out to the end. Buck's in front. Tommy and I are walking a little bit behind him. He just stood there and looked in the water a little bit, turned around and started walking back. And as he walked by us, he didn't really say it, but he sort of mumbled, damn drinking water. And he kept walking. I said to Tommy, what did he say? Tommy said, I think he said, dang, drinking water. So by the time we walked back in, got off that dock, started up towards the trucks. He said, come on, boys, let's go. And I said, well, do you, do you want to launch now? Launch the boats? He said, no, we're leaving. I said, leaving? Isn't this the lake? Where are we going to go? He said, well, you know, Richie called me from down there in, in the land. He said he was up at uh, Santee Cooper in South Carolina, and he said the stripers are really going. He said they're going crazy. He said, so let's go over to Santee and fish some stripers. <laughs> now, wait a minute now. We just drove, whatever it was, six or 700 miles. Walked out on the dock, saw that clear water, and said, drinking water. I won't tell you the first word that he said, but drinking water was the essence of the point. We got back in those trucks, and we took off for Santee Cooper, right back the same direction we just came from, another six or 700 miles. Reason? And he never says anything. He, he, he never said, I'm not going to fish there. That's the clearest water I ever saw. I wouldn't even put the boat in. But that's what happened. The water was gin clear. He wasn't going to fish. He drove 13 or 1,400 miles out of his way to say, I'm not fishing. Because of the water color. Now, uh, I really couldn't believe that. And what made matters even worse, we got down to Santee Cooper, not that day, but the next day. And here they had had a bad rainstorm and stuff, and that, that Santee Cooper was so muddy. That fishing report must have been five days old because we couldn't even put a boat in at Santee Cooper. We, we, saw, the, we saw the royally muddy uh, reservoir at 
down in South Carolina, and he said, load up, and we drove back to the factory. Like a 1,500-mile round trip. And because of the water, we never even put the boat in. In the case of the real trip, we didn't put the boat in because it was clear water. He's not fishing clear water. Out of day. We can offset some of the ill effects of all of that with wire line and our deep water mapping, interpretation, presentation of lures. You can't, but you're making matters worse for yourself if you choose, purposely choose, a clear lake. If I have a choice, I'm not choosing a clear lake, nor would Buck. He always harped and harped and harped about watercolor. And if I went to a reservoir and fished it, and I said, boy, Buck, that's pretty clear. He'd say, well, how, did, how was it up at the headwaters? And if I would have said I didn't go up to look, he would have disowned me. See, in a reservoir, the further up you go, the better that watercolor gets. So we say you can't change the weather, but you can choose the water. And sometimes if your reservoir is clear, uh, I guarantee you, you go up towards the headwaters, it's going gonna, it's gonna to color up for you a little bit. That's how we won our musky tournament. Going towards the headwaters, finding a good water color. Next time we get together, we'll be talking more and more about water. And we're going to talk about weed growth and its effect on water color. A lot of things coming up that's important for you to know. So thanks for being with me today. I hope you learned a little something and be sure to uh, follow us on Instagram, like us on Facebook, and be sure to subscribe to our channel if you haven't already done it. Appreciate you, my friends, and we'll see you the next time.